Oh my goodness. Well, good morning, good people. Mark Holmes here, of course, with my buddy Cowboy Joe Boo. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. I hope everybody's having a great Saturday. It's going to be a busy day for me today. Um, we got a lot of stuff going on here at the Red Brick House, and we're getting ready to go to Vermont on Monday. I can't believe the day after tomorrow. Um, we're going to be rebuilding some homes um, up there that was uh, uh, close to Burlington, Vermont, that were flooded out last um, June or July. And that's one of those things that I love to do is trying to help get people back on their feet. So I've got to get ready for that trip. And of course, I got to keep you up to speed with everything that is the Dallas Cowboys and rookie OTAs. But We've got all day today. Today is day number two. They'll be on the field twice today uh, getting you know, th their induction into the Dallas Cowboys. We've seen some things that actually make you feel really, really good. And knowing that all these guys are under contract and stuff, I want to revisit a little bit because the Cowboys have been laughed at. They've been joked upon. They've been talked about. They've been slandered. And they've been left as roadkill because they said that this is the worst offseason in the Dallas Cowboys ever. That they're, you know, you, you think that they're going to be the worst team in the division, if not in the NFL. That they're so inept that they can't do anything. They haven't created any money. They haven't made any big moves in free agency. Uh, they have no cap space. The Eagles have spent $400 million. And the Dallas Cowboys have spent about twenty. And so they equate the amount of money that you spend in free agency into winning. Now, there is some truth to you have to get the players, without a doubt. I'm not saying that you don't. But the Cowboys have not been that team that has spent a lot in free agency, and they've won the second most amount of games to Kansas City over the last three seasons, which is kind of crazy. It's counterintuitive to what you think. And for those that think that this has been the worst off season in the history of the Cowboys, I want to take you back just a couple of years, and I want you to listen to this. We're almost four months in, right? We're almost in April. And I went back to January 1. Think about how... Think about how negative it's all been. Yeah. And and I and I, you know, God bless the Cowboys. I know you guys are the flagship. They let you guys say whatever you want to say. For like I my time, my three years there, there's only one time, Sean, that they said, Yeah, don't ask that question. Everything else, it's been fair game. Yeah. Not everybody does that. We start with the Washington uh, Commanders. Yes. But their flagship station saying, oh, thank God we can talk about the Commanders now. <laughs> no, no longer affiliated with them. Right. So, but I looked at really, when I, Kevin, when I looked at just like a day-by-day -day timeline, you know, they beat the Eagles on January 8th. They lost two out of their three games, right? They blamed the officials for basically two of the three losses, which is terrible. Yeah. Dak Prescott sits there and endorses fans throwing junk at officials after the San Francisco game. He has to come out and apologize. You've got a PR director who retires. Nobody, no big deal. Two weeks later, he has, there's this horrible story about him being accused of voyeurism, which he denied. Yeah. But the Cowboys have to throw a $2.5 million check at four cheerleaders. Dak Prescott has another surgery. The Cowboys trade a wide receiver that they used the number one pick on back in 2018 in exchange for a fifth because the coaching staff doesn't like him, right? Then they give all this money to a guy who tore his ACL on January 2nd. Michael Gallup's not going to be ready for camp, right? Tank Lawrence is their best pass rusher. He comes back, which is, that's a highlight. Jerry Jones gets named in a, you know, Springer-like lawsuit. <laughs> Randy Gregory, whom the Cowboys stuck by, despite the fact that he had done nothing for them for years, yep. gives them the middle finger, right, on a flip. Then they've got to cut Lyle Collins because the coaching staff didn't like him. But they kept their punter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mac, Mac why, why is Stephen Jones the Alan Greenspan of the NFL? <laughs> That's a great one-liner, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, because it's so – we see all these teams talk about, 
we're in cap hell, we're in cap hell. And then they go out and they trade for Tyreek Hill or they make these giant moves and add this big contract. I know the salary cap is a real thing. And, you know, I've talked to Stephen Jones, whom I like a lot, and he's, he has come to ad- admit and embrace the idea if you're going into free agency, that means you're overspending on that player because you made a big mistake two or three years ago. Okay, that's fine. That's that sound philosophy. Yeah. And are you getting any better? Are the Dallas Cowboys today, no. today on March 23rd, part of March, March 25th, are they any better today, Sean? No. No way. They were on. Okay. And no one, and no one, not even the biggest Homer fan. I mean, not even Mickey Spagnuolo would make that kid. Mickey might. <laughs> Mickey <laughs> might, but. He tried. <laughs> yeah, he would try. But I don't think anyone would say that. They, they all, no, and, and they all so say like, it's it's early. It's early. Oh, I know. And, like, are they going to – there's there's nobody left that they're going to get off the street that's going to make him any better. The only thing that's going to make him any better, they think Dak Prescott is as good as Aaron, Aaron Rodgers, <laughs> that they can put pretty good players around him, and, and he'll make them great, and they'll win 10 or 11, 12 games. And the NFC East still is garbage. Yes. And the NFC. All right. So let's think about this for a second. So they cut Lyle Collins, and Lyle Collins signed a nice contract to go to Cincinnati. And didn't work out. He actually came back here, um, didn't get back out on the field. Uh, Miami did sign Cedric Wilson and Tariq Hill. Um, but what has that got in Miami? Did that get them a Super Bowl? Do we look and say that the Miami Dolphins are a better team than the Dallas Cowboys? You know, we, we both lost the same weekend. Um, Randy Gregory has gone to Denver. He got paid. Didn't do much there, except maybe get high. Went to San Francisco and got a couple excuse me, a couple of sacks. And what's he done? So we ended up losing. Now Amari Cooper, he's got still the same kind of numbers he had here. Um again, they're a playoff team just like we are and lost the first weekend. But the moves that they made, you know, Connor Williams was also let go. Connor Williams became a pretty good center, although he's rehabbing a knee right now. There was some talk where people were saying maybe the Cowboys go get Connor Williams after he rehabs to play center. But you go through and you think about that. When you listen to all those things that happened, you lost Amari Cooper, you lost Cedric Wilson, you lost Randy Gregory, you lost Lyle Collins, you lost Connor uh, Williams. It's like, damn. Who's uh, you know, who's left? And here it is. The Cowboys still win 12 games. Now, I'm not discounting that they haven't won in this, you know, pl- done well in the playoffs. We need to do better. But I think they've addressed some of that issue. Some of that issue is, I hate to say it, we've been soft in the middle. We've been soft and we get punched in the nose and we don't didn't have the tools or the attitude to respond. And I think that's where Mike Zimmer is going through. Instead of saying, Mozzie, we need you to lose weight and get under 300 pounds and be svelte and be able to attack the quarterback. We need you to be a battering ram right now. We need you to be a beast in the middle. And that's why he's put on 30 some more pounds to get back in there and they, they want him to get up to about 350. That's why you end up getting a guy like Neelan, who's a run stopper. That's why they've gone through and they've signed Eric Kendricks. Now here's the thing that's interesting here because, you know, that's a misnomer. I fell into it myself. I, you know, where you, the mob mentality takes over. Okay, you end up hearing everybody talking about, oh, the Cowboys didn't get this one. Oh, my God, the Eagles, they got Saquon Barkley. The Eagles are always getting guys. They're always getting guys, and we're always right there. The Eagles are always spending money, and we're always still right there with the Eagles. It's usually a two-horse race in our division. We always hear that the Commanders are going to be better now, and that the Giants, they're just right there. (coughs) Yet... It always comes down to the Cowboys and Eagles basically splitting against each other. One wins the division, the other one wins the division the next year. With two completely different philosophies. Now, they said that the Cowboys are screwed because they're not going to be able to fill in all the holes in the roster. Um, 
and I don't think that this cake is done yet. If we look at right now, this is what's kind of interesting here. Let me pop this up here. We look at over the cap. You see right now, the Dallas Cowboys actually aren't in the worst cap situation at the moment. The Bills actually have a worse situation. The Dolphins are even worse. The Seahawks are even worse than that. The Giants are down to a million, and the Buccaneers are down to $300,000. The top of the charts, of course, are the Patriots at $50 million, the Commanders with forty-three, the Jags at thirty-four, and then you see the Eagles with twenty-seven. If we dig a little deeper in the Dallas Cowboys... Right now, they have $3.8 million. It's like, wait a minute. Haven't we been hovering around like eight, nine million all off season? Yeah. Yeah, we have. And we haven't made major plays. I'll give you that. But when you pull off getting potentially two starters with one first round pick on your offensive line, taking care of two needs, and you have some guys that people are very, very high on, like Brock Hoffman, that will be competing for your center starting position, which will be one will be the starter, another one's going to be some depth. The Cowboys' offensive line may be in better shape right now than it's been over the last three years because we've had Tyron Smith, you know, who's averaged seven and a half games over the last four years. We've ended up bringing in guys like Jason Peters, who can't play more than about 20 plays a game. We've brought in the Agotas to be, you know, a, a, a depth guy and things. We've gone through and we've done all kinds of things trying to get the offensive line stable. Now, again, we're going to have some young guys that are going to be getting their lumps. But you look at this and say, we're in a better position right now, depth-wise, on the offensive line than we've been in years. Now, running back-wise, I'm not going to say that Zeke Elliott is going to be the, the game changer, but philosophy-wise, when you look at Mike McCarthy, in his whole time in Green Bay, he only had two running backs that rushed for 1,000 yards. And the year that he won the Super Bowl, his leading rusher had 731. So it kind of fits what Mike McCarthy's doing. Now, I do think that they need to add a veteran receiver, but here's where it gets to be interesting. You look at that and say they only have $3.8 million. That's not a whole lot of money for them to work with. But in less than three weeks, they'll get $9.5 million because Michael Gallup gets back. So now you're looking at having close to $14 million. And if they do, and I think they will at some point, you know, they always get their stars in. They don't ever not sign somebody. They don't do it on our schedule. If they get C.D. Lamb, they'll have some more money there. So the Cowboys potentially have space to go ahead and do these moves with some of the quality veterans that are out there. They also have four compensatory picks for next year that they'll be able to say, you know what, we're going to be getting three extra fives and an extra six probably next year. We can take our five and our six, maybe our seven. And we can use those to trade to get some more help on the team. And so you start thinking about these things and saying, maybe they're not as dumb as everybody has made them out to be. You know, there's the old saying, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Well, you can look at it and say, they've done a whole lot with next to nothing. Or as Jerry Jones says, we have to do more with less. Now, you're going to have to throw out the whole thing all in. But if the Cowboys go through, and let's say hypothetically, that between now and the beginning of the season, they do trade and get a running back. And they do go out there and they get another really good wide receiver. And they end up getting another defensive lineman like a Calais Campbell. That all-in statement looks a little bit closer to doing things. You know, a lot of times we rely on names because it's almost funny to me when I hear people say, oh, man, go, we, we should go get Odell Beckham Jr. And it's kind of like you do know that Odell, um, that Brandon Cooks actually had a better season than Odell last year, right? But the perception is, oh, my God, Odell, man, he's a game changer. But think about this. 
Cowboys signed Brandon Cook. It did cost him a fifth-round pick for about half the money of what Odell went for. He got $15 million to go to um, Baltimore. And he was there for one year, leaving dead money. And had less yards than Brandon Cooks. So, in retrospect, in retrospect, the Cowboys were actually pretty wise at what they did. Now, the biggest thing they need to do is, I think it's the attitude and being able to handle things when things get tough. Mental toughness. I hope that Mike Zimmer is the one to be able to do that. But for all those out there that are saying, oh my God, man, these guys are bones, man. Get rid of them and things. Well, I can look at, um, you could say Khalil Mack, you know, the Raiders. Oh man, you know, let's get rid of Khalil Mack and pick up all the picks. And that move didn't exactly help that team get any better. They stayed right where they were. The thing is, is when you have great players, what you need to do is you need to surround them with other ones that are really good to take advantage of their skills. Now, that has been the thing that the Cowboys have been lacking. When Denver had Von Miller, they added a DeMarcus Ware on the other side, which made Von Miller that much better and helped prolong DeMarcus Ware's career. So we're going to end this with the amazing things that Micah Parsons has done thus far in the NFL. Off to a trip to Asia. Micah Parsons has been all in this offseason. On the field, it's the same approach. Parsons just one of three players since sacks became official in 1982 with 40 sacks and 200 tackles in his first three seasons. Look at the list he joins. Hall of Famers and the late great ones. Reggie White and Derek Thomas. Not many people can wreck the game like Micah. How would you define what a game wrecker is? A game wrecker is a person, the offenses put that circle around you and saying, this is a guy that we have to stop. Back to throw, look at, oh, he's chased. Parsons has got him again. You have to take over the game. You have to make people fear what you are. When I say the name, Micah Parsons, what's the first word or thought that comes to your mind? Girl, the brother can run. Parsons coming! Parsons got him! He can put one foot in front of the other. They put fear in your heart. Flushed out by Parsons, sacked by Parsons. He has to work on a couple other things. Such as? His inside move and his power move. But let me tell you, when he turns that corner, and that offensive tackle start leaning, he throws them across like like um, um, a sack of potatoes. I'm amazed um, with some of the moves he makes. Let's go! It's almost like if you got a rubber band and you sort of pulled it back as far as you can, like a bow and arrow, and you just let it go. He did that every play. Is there a play that comes to mind that really defines Micah Parsons as a game wrecker? One play that I saw with Micah, he goes underneath, runs right into the guard, and he beats the guard. And then there's a running back right there. And so he ends up beating the running back and gets a sack. He's hit! He's sacked by Parsons! He lines up inside of a guard, and before they can blink, he's through the hole. And that's what LT did. <laughs> still don't understand how they can just line up and before they blink an eye, they throw. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. I'll take you back to Bill Parcells, and I heard Lawrence Taylor stories every day about how to play, how to play with a tenacity. We always said, turn up the radio and make it as loud as possible. And that's what Lawrence Taylor did. With Micah, he has all the tools. The tools of the Lawrence Taylor a knack to get to the quarterback. If Micah can be consistent this whole year, that's when he 
gets that Lawrence Taylor factor. Pressure. Good night, Nurse Parsons. You know what? what are they talking about? Get that. Without a doubt, there was no question. Lawrence Taylor changed the way that that position was played. How has Micah Parsons done that for this generation? He's set by Parsons. Teams are trying to draft players like Micah that can play outside, inside, right or left. And so that means that he's already changed the game. The mm -hmm. only thing he has to do to seal his legacy is win a Super Bowl. There you go. If he can win a Super Bowl, let me tell you, untouchable. Wow. Love that. All right, good people. I got to get this day started. Waynesboro.com is coming by to do a follow-up on the uh, Red Brick House here. We're going to be talking about our Red Brick campaign where we are um, – doing a walkway, a history timeline of the 204 years that the Red Brick House has been here. We've already got uh, my man Shane Olderholt, Older, Oldenholt, Ronald Johnson, and Randy Massey have already actually purchased bricks that will have their names on it or whatever else you guys want to have on them um, added to this, which they'll be here for eternity, hopefully. All right, good people. We will see you all soon. Peace. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. is ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by Lincoln Mercury. Nobody has more kinds of cars or more kinds of people. See them at the sign of the cat. By Goodyear, makers of the custom steel guard radial tire. And by State Farm Mutual. Almost anywhere you live, there's a State Farm agent nearby. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there.